I have been using this monitor right here, the Philips Evnia 34 inch ultra wide for over a month. And in today's review, I'm gonna tell you guys all the things I love, like, and don't like about this monitor. And as the name implies, it is a 34 inch 21 by nine aspect ratio ultra wide monitor with a pixel density of 110 pixels roughly per inch and also a resolution of 3440 by 1440 pixels. Now it's also got an 1800R curvature and a maximum refresh rate of 175 hertz. Now, first thing is first, this is easily the best gaming panel I have used in my life, period. I feel like Philips, who have just got into the gaming monitor scene with their Evnia lineup, have absolutely nailed it for one of their first attempts, not just at a gaming monitor, but also for a QD OLED panel, which comes from Samsung. And this time around, Samsung do deserve a lot of credit too, because you may notice this panel has a glossy finish. And it's not just a regular glossy finish. When I did more research on it as to why the reflections aren't as bad as say an LG OLED, it came down to the fact that Samsung are actually coating the panel with silver nanoparticles. And that helps reduce glare especially in sunlit environments. So basically, in other words, you can get the best of both worlds in that you'll get rich and vibrant colors coming through as well as clearer text, but at the same time, you'll minimize those annoying reflections, especially compared to typical gloss coatings from either glass or not 2H rated panels, which in this case, the glossy finish actually has a 2H rating. So the coating on this thing straight away is probably the best you can get especially for a gaming panel at this point in time. Though laying down another W with this monitor is the response times and also the input lag, or should I say lack of input lag with this panel. If I show you guys the 1000 FPS footage I took here, you'll see that the response times from frame to frame are practically instant, meaning that this gaming panel can shift from one frame to another in under one millisecond, which makes it so that fast moving images will be cleaner and easier to see. And it also make it so that your eyes are in better shape because they won't have to focus so hard, especially if you're trying to track fast moving images. Now onto the input lag, which is equally as important as your response times. Here's where we got out the 1000 FPS camera yet again. And this is where I scored the lowest draw that I've ever seen across any system combined with any monitor. Now keep in mind, I have in the last few days been tuning up my personal system for the lowest input lag possible, but here is where we managed to score the fastest draw ever on Tech yes City of six milliseconds between mouse movement being detected and input shown on the screen reacting to that movement. In other words, this monitor would have input lag in between zero to one millisecond. Though of course, that's providing you turn on low input latency mode to begin with, which is something I'll critique here about Philips. I wish they would just enable this by default. Then now it's time to go over the OSD, which you can use from the single directional button on the back, which will also turn the monitor off and on. And here's where Philips score another huge W for the implementation of their OSD. Now, straight away, you've got different modes to choose from that are pre-programmed, but of course you can program your own modes into this monitor and you've got the option to change brightness, contrast, and smart contrast, which you'll have to turn FreeSync off in order to get that setting. And then you've got the gamma settings there if you want to make games brighter or darker from the get-go. And then you've got this very interesting setting here called sharpness. Now this one is a filter implemented by Philips themselves and by default on all the profiles, it's on 50. I personally would not change this at all because it does correct some of the drawbacks from the triangular pixel layout that Samsung have used on the QD OLED panel. And it differs from a standard rectangular format used on the W OLED panels. And this has its benefits of course in games in that the colors just come through, through their own individual lighting and also the mix looks absolutely gorgeous. However, it can leave you wanting more in terms of text and not looking sharp. And so if you turn this all the way to zero, you'll notice the text does look a little bit blurry, but on its default setting, everything just looks perfect. 
Now they've also got sRGB mode on here as well. And I found this monitor from the get-go, even on the standard profile, is actually quite color accurate. However, if you do need professional color accuracy, you definitely wanna go out and get a color braider or get the monitor color braided somewhere. This next tab here is my absolute favorite, and this is the game mode, which has from the get-go your adaptive sync, which is in a range from 48 hertz on this panel all the way up to 175 hertz, meaning anywhere in between there, the monitor's frame rate will match that coming out of your GPU for no tearing whatsoever. However, this next setting here is the crosshair, and this is awesome because turning this on will just pull up a white uh, crosshair in the middle of your screen, and I found it's extremely good for FPS games. I really like it in particular for Apex Legends. It actually helped me play the game a lot better because some of the iron sights and even some of the scopes you pick up absolutely suck in this game, and it does really well. Now, the smart crosshair feature will change the color of the crosshair based on the image that you're looking at. I personally found this a little bit distracting, but the default crosshair here was really good. Then they've got the dynamic dark boost. Now for FPS, I love having this on level one. If you go to level two and also level three, I think it crushes the shadows and highlights way too much, but level one, it will actually bring up those dark areas a lot better than just having it off. And the thing about OLEDs is they've got really good deep levels of blacks, but if you're an FPS gamer, that can be a bad thing because you can't see those dark areas too well. And so this will help even out that advantage. But on that note of evening out that advantage, there's a setting called Smart Frame. And this essentially can add a gamma layer over if you wanna use it for a game and have it so that if you're playing say Apex Legends or CSGO or some game where everything's just dark but you still need to be competitive, you can just whack that on top and that will essentially alleviate the problem of those darker areas too. Now above that, there's two different settings that we're gonna to touch on. Low input lag, you'll want this on. If you've got adaptive sync turned on, it'll automatically turn on low input lag anyhow. Then there's the sharpshooter setting, which is essentially 100%, 150%, and 200% zoom on the center of your screen. I found this a little bit distracting though, if you are say turtling in FPS games all the time and you want that extra zoom, it's a digital zoom then this will give you that advantage there. Go on to another really interesting setting here is the light mode. And this is what Philips have with their Ambi Glow technology where you can have it set to follow video. So whatever's on the screen, this will match that with RGB lighting from the rear of the panel. It can also follow the audio if you want it to, or it can color shift with standard profiles. And if you don't like that, you can also download the Philips software which is actually really important because you can update the firmware of the monitor through that software and use it via Windows if you want to. I personally don't like adding any extra software to my Windows if I don't have to, so I'll probably update the firmware once every few months or at least check and then uninstall the application. Though in this case, the follow video setting on Ambilight works really well. However, enabling this will also disable the smart frame setting here. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but that's something to be aware of. However, going over the inputs here, we've got HDMI one and two, and this will be my first and only big critiquing point of this monitor is that they've got two HDMI 2.0 ports and not 2.1. So these ports will max out at 100 Hertz at the 1440 by 3440 resolution on 21 by nine. Now the display port as well as the USB-C, so this is what you'll wanna to use to get that 175 Hertz as well as full FreeSync support and even 10-bit support if your GPU can do that. Now for audio, you get two 5-watt speakers, and if you're a headphone user, these speakers will double down as a great backup set of speakers. Of course, if you're an audiophile, you may be wishing more from audio, and you're probably gonna have your own custom speakers anyway. But for a pair of monitor speakers, they do sound really good, but of course they are lacking bass, which you're not gonna get from two five watt speakers. Next up here is the system setting and you can also have a picture by picture or picture in picture, which enables you to connect two different monitor cables to the monitor and have two separate monitors running, or you can have a little picture if you wanna 
get a, say for instance, you're watching TV through this monitor and you wanna see if your favorite program's ready to come on and you're just playing games in the meantime, you can use that as well, that feature. And then you've got language here and you've got a heap of different languages to choose from. I'll just quickly go through that so you guys can see what you've got there. And then you've got the resolution notice, which I personally like to leave on. And then we've got the CEC as well as the OLED panel care, which this one's really important because you can have the screensaver fast, which will just dim the lights when there's a static image very quickly, or you can have it on slow, which is what I personally prefer. And then we've got pixel orbiting, which if you turn this on fast, it'll just orbit the pixels to prevent burn-in. I personally like to leave this on the slow setting. And then we've got pixel refresh, which if you turn this on, it'll put your monitor into refresh mode manually, as well as the auto warning, which will let you know in four hour and then two hour increments after that to tell you, hey, you should refresh your OLED monitor so it doesn't suffer from any burn-in. Then the last setting here is the fan control. So this monitor, because it's so high powered and it can use up to over 100 watts, that's what I tested from the wall with a white background on maximum brightness, this can use a fan to cool it down. However, in practice, I have never heard this thing once. So it's basically inaudible at best. And it's also got the mode there for auto, quiet and off. They're two in the same quiet and auto. So I would just leave this on auto as it will spin up when the power consumption actually gets quite large. However, the last thing you may notice here is the refresh rates bouncing up and down. This is because we're in Apex Legends and the frame rate is going up and down. And so our monitor will show us that in real time to be able to reflect the adaptive sync working. Now, if you're wondering if you can wall mount this monitor instead of using the included stand, the answer is yes, Philips include the VESA mount kit with this monitor. The stand itself is height and swivel adjust. And on the back, you get the four display ins, which the cables for all those types are included, as well as your power cable and a USB type A to type B, which can connect up to the hub, which can power four external USB 3.2 ports. And you can also run that via the USB type C with display port alt mode. And there's your headphone jack out too, if you wish to use your headphones from this monitor. So for one of their first attempts at a gaming monitor with the Evnia lineup, I'm just absolutely blown away by what they've done here. They've gone the extra mile, as we've seen with that OSD, and added in things that just make it so that the ultra wide is not just the best experience if you're playing FPS games and things like that, but they've also thought about MOBA players, RTS players with that smart screen size setting, as well as the AmbiGlow just adding in that immersive feeling, especially at nighttime. This monitor just hits all those check boxes for what I would want from a panel personally. Though as with anything in life, you usually get what you pay for. And this is where the kicker comes in with the Philips Evnia. And it's 1299 MSRP. And in fact, the only place I could find it for for sale at this point in time was B&H Photo, and they've got it back ordered. So you'll have to wait a little bit to get one of these panels. But if you're looking for that ultimate experience for PC gaming, and you have as well, this is a big one, you have the hardware to support that. In this case, I found an RTX 4070 worked really well with this panel, especially if I'm dropping some of the settings to high from ultra, then it's going to give you an absolute phenomenal experience. And so one thing I will touch on before I get on out of here too, is for people who have say an LG C1 48 inch or a 55 inch gloss OLED, is it that much better? And the answer to that is, I would say they're still in the same league. OLED's OLED, especially gloss OLED. It doesn't get a whole lot better. So I'm not gonna tell you guys, oh my God, it's so much better than an LG OLED. It's a little bit better, but if you've already got a gloss OLED and you're coming to this expecting something so much more, then I don't think you're going to get that, that's all. So I wanted to put that out there that it is a little bit better, but it's not in a different league. Glossy OLED is practically the best thing you can get for PC gaming in terms of immersion, in terms of rich, vibrant colors. But this monitor does excel in the OSD, which is why I dedicated a lot of this review to it, because it just has so many extra features that Philips have thought about and they've added in and you can customize that and tune it to any way you want a game, even if you're a competitive 
FPS player. Though some of the final questions you may have is brightness as well as HDR. This is rated for HDR 400 officially. When I tested it in 10-bit HDR mode, it was adding to the immersion, but I wouldn't use this for FPS games. I'd only use this for games with proper HDR support from the get-go, and it'll add to that RPG feel if that's what you want. Now, I'm personally looking forward to using this with Baldur's Gate 3 when that comes out, and hopefully that has proper HDR support. Though the final question is, what about the maximum brightness when it comes to things like playing FPS games? Is that 250 nits? of max white brightness at 8-bit going to be a factor that's going to leave me not being able to compete. And here's where I was playing FPS on this personally, Apex Legends, CSGO. I was having no problems seeing my opponents. It was really good. In the case of Apex, I did want to have that backlight boost on level one, and I found that made the experience perfect for that game. And even above all that, if I wanted to see the shadows easier, I then got the option to boost the gamma as well as add the smart frame on top of that. So I don't think you're gonna come into any issues if you're a competitive FPS player and you still want to enjoy the monitor outside of competitive gaming. Anyhow guys, I hope you enjoyed today's review of the Philips Evnia 34M2C8600. That's the official name for it. The 21x9 1440p by 3440 pixelated monitor. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button for us. And if you have any questions or comments, be sure to drop them down below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Just like this question of the day here. And this comes from Kamikaze Lucas. And they ask, if you run the CPU at 4.4 gigahertz, does it end up using more power and idle than stock or does it use the same? Now this ultimately depends on the CPU you're using. If the CPU has, for instance, a 100 base clock in the case of Intel CPUs, it doesn't matter what speed you set that max overclock to, if you've got that base frequency the same, it's gonna downclock to that in idle mode. In the case of Intel ring bus CPUs, I believe it's 800 megahertz or something like that. So it'll downclock to that in full idle mode. So it shouldn't use up any more power. Though AMD CPUs, I do believe if you do custom overclock them, they can use up a little bit more power. It's going to be negligible, but you can check that yourself ultimately by buying a water meter from the wall. And so you can check power consumption on idle before and after. I personally recommend everyone have one of these because they will help you diagnose issues with PCs as well if you're having problems in certain scenarios. So ultimately the answer to that is it depends on the CPU. But I hope that answers that question. And with that aside, if you stayed this far and you're enjoying that Tech Yes content, then be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell on the way out, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.